Lita O'Halloran, the other side of the screen, is a biologist studying water quality in New Brunswick for the Passamaquoddy Nation. Welcome, Lita. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm very well, thanks. Um, you know, when I lived in New Brunswick and even after I have uh, ceased to live in New Brunswick, I always think of it as a pristine area, salmon fishing, what have you. What is the top of mind findings that you can share with us about water quality in the region? Right, so we uh, only look at water quality within the Canadian side of the Passamaquoddy territory, at least I do. Uh, there is work being done on the US side of the territory as well. Uh, which uh, usually we like to refer to the east side and west side of the river rather than the border because to the Passamaquoddy there is no border. Uh, but on this side, uh, you know, we've been looking at water quality for just over a year now. Um, and what we found so far through those is that most of the watersheds we're looking at are in fair condition. So, you know, they're not horrible, but there's always room for improvement. And what is the um, cause of the rating only being fair? What are the uh, pollutants or the impediments or what is the state of the uh, waterways that gives you some concern? Right, so we're looking at uh, just some basic water quality parameters. Uh, we're not focused specific on any pollutants. Uh, we look at baseline uh, physical parameters in regards to fish habitat. Um, so some of those include temperature, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, uh, salinity, and pH, and a couple others. Um, so from those, that FAIR rating comes from uh, an index, which is used by Canadian standards for um, the uh, health of aquatic life. Um, so this is provided by a Canadian guideline. Now, why in a waterway, which I guess means river or stream or uh, pond, why would the oxygen levels and other elements that you mentioned be of concern? I mean, nature knows best, doesn't it? And if that's the oxygen level, isn't that, aren't them the breaks? <laughs> yeah, so in regards to why it's important is, um, in especially regards to fish and fish habitat um, is, especially for spawning and other factors. Um, things like eggs require certain um, conditions within the river to be able to hatch. Um, even just livelihoods outside of spawning, such as salmon are very sensitive species to different ranges in temperature and pH. So how these parameters are in the environment affects where the fish are and their survival to a good extent. Um, and some of what we're finding is natural, but some of it can be influenced by human behavior. Um, so things like um, dams obviously will reduce uh, circulation of water and reduce circulation reduces oxygen. Um, and things like um, uh, farm fields and other sources that are putting um, nitrogen and fertilizers into the water will then affect pH, total dissolved solids and, and other parameters. So there's some relationships between those that we can infer. Well, fair enough. Now I know what we humans are doing wrong. Um, I, I think the fish are blameless, but uh, you're the biologist, you'd know best. Um, it, it seems to me that a lay person would think, well, isn't a dam great? It creates this big reservoir place for fish to swim around, but of course it also blocks the river and prevents their getting to their natural habitat. And uh, I think, as you just said, the deeper water makes it, uh, changes the temperature so it's not as hospitable. Have I got that about right? Uh, not necessarily uh, in terms of depth of water. I mean, um, when you're creating deeper waters, there's different levels of oxygen at the surface versus uh, the, the deeper part of the water, same with temperature. Um, so it doesn't necessarily make it less hospitable, but it definitely changes and alters the natural state. Is there any good coming of the changing of the natural state? You know, uh, it's an ill wind that blows no good, they say. Um, global warming or the warming of water temperature would surely be more hospitable to some species or increase a season or what have you. Is it all bad when, when things change or sometimes do they change for the better? Um, this is a large, large loaded question. Um, you know, obviously, like you said, as the water levels or temperatures change, that could 
uh, bring other species into the Bay of Fundy and into the Passamaquoddy Bay, um, which could be beneficial. There'd be longer growing seasons, so potentially larger fish, but that can also introduce invasive species, a species that are not native to the area might now have access uh, to the waters and outcompete our native species. So there, there's good and bad. Now, I'd like to follow on on, on what we humans can do. Um, I've um, operated a, a plow and a baler and a rake and what have you on farms. And if I were near a water course, I would uh, take your information and say, well, I'm, I'm going to spread fertilizer a little farther away from that water course, or maybe not plow as close to it so there wouldn't be as much runoff. Uh, beyond that, I don't have much expertise. But what is it that uh, people with camps or with farms or who enjoy the outdoors, uh, what can we do to make your next uh, examination, maybe next summer, a, a little more positive? Yeah, so one of the larger things I think that any landowner can do um, is just ensure that there's a good riparian zone around the water. And so what that means is um, the amount of habitat that isn't plowed or removed uh, close to the waterway. So in typical, I think New Brunswick recommends 15 to 30 meters from any river um, to keep plant and vegetative life. Uh, this allows the banks to be stabilized so you're not having sediment flowing into the river. Um, it also provides shade for the water so that, you know, decreases the high temperatures in the summer. Um, and a lot of the times when you have trees and grasses and things, some of that will fall into the waterways naturally and that actually provides food for invertebrates which then help fish. So, you know, having that input from vegetative life from the land-based ecosystem definitely helps the aquatic-based ecosystems. Now, a lot of environmentalists and ecologists say that this uh, notion of the individual responsibility that I just led us into is a bit of a con because uh, what an individual can do, even a farmer, even a, someone with a large farm can do, pales in comparison to what industry can do. And, um, you know, one of the cases is the use of uh, plastic water bottles. I mean, only about 8% of those are recycled. And uh, there's no particular reason why we need plastic water bottles. We could use thermoses or could use something else. I'm digressing because the uh, good news at Milltown near St. Stephen or in St. Stephen is that the dam is going to be uh, removed and the river restored and the habitat. And that may uh, generate lots of uh, fish and uh, larger sturgeon, which have you know, had their growth stunted and be food for other uh, aquatic uh, living things uh, in, in the bay. So that's my long-winded uh, diatribe uh, leading up to the question, uh, what should we be doing on a much more um, mechanized basis or a larger basis, industrial or governmental basis? Is there something bigger that we could be doing? Yeah, so um, as I kind of mentioned before, I mentioned dams, but there are other barriers to uh, fish passage, uh, which also affect water quality. They're all relatively interlinked because water quality could be a barrier to fish passage. Um, but um, one thing that my uh, focus is on with the Passamaquoddy is increasing fish passage. And that um, applies a lot to culverts, uh, it applies to bridges, it applies to fords, which are waterways that you drive over when there is no culvert in place. Um, and so a lot of the times uh, what we do as a society is put in what we call just, um, just classic pipe uh, culverts. So they're just round, uh, they go underneath roadways and it typically passes water but they're not well designed to pass fish and allow a river to act like a river. Uh, a lot of the times water will go into these pipes, but there's no sediment or anything in it to slow the water down. So a lot of the time velocity increases in these pipes, which instead on the outside end of that culvert will gouge out the river bed. And so eventually over time, a lot of these become perched. Um, and require fish to jump up into the culvert, which typically are quite shallow on the inside and there's not quite enough water for them to swim through. That's, that's if the fish are going back upstream to spawn, they have to jump up through a culvert. I, I would imagine they could easily get damaged in the culvert, their, their scales and so on, uh, scarred by the concrete. Yes, yes, and a lot of the times they're also made of metal or plastic 
Uh, but yeah, that's a possibility. A lot of the metal ones, they're rusted through over time. And, you know, that obviously causes issues and could cause damage. Um, and the other thing is too, they don't allow other aquatic life to pass. Um, you know, a lot of bugs and aquatic invertebrates that the fish feed on, uh, even aquatic mammals like beavers and things like that uh, tend to clog these culverts, which, you know, uh, then further reduce passage, you know, minks and things that need to travel through uh, waterways, um, you know, instead are going on the roads and then getting hit by vehicles. So uh, what we typically recommend is either to implement a bridge structure or what we call an open arch culvert, uh, which is basically an arch way that uh, allows the natural stream bed to go underneath. And well, I, I was just going to say, it doesn't sound like rocket science uh, for humans and roads and automobiles to coexist with fish, and you've just articulated uh, the way around it. Now, what, what is the reception that you're getting when you're, uh, I'm just kind of imagining you're talking to some burly official with the uh, highways department or, or the city uh, public works department, are, are they receptive to your input and, and suggestions on how to modify the culverts and other things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've just started some preliminary discussions uh, with them on that, definitely receptive. Um, you know, everyone wants to work together and a lot of these methods of using bridge and open arch, they typically are wider. Uh, which are beneficial for flooding. So it actually helps uh, in most cases um, because you're allowing more water to pass through and under one of these. So in the event of a 150 year or 200 year flood event, um, you know, you're not gonna have the road wash out. So they're typically receptive. Um, the main um, issue or reluctance about it is typically these structures cost more um, and you know, it, it requires a little bit more planning to ensure that the abutments, which are the edges of where the culvert or bridge sit, um, are outside the stream channel so that they don't get washed out. So it's a little bit more complex. Uh, you know, if you're a landowner and you just want to, you know, build your road, you're likely not going to put one of these in. But our hope is that you do, because in the long term, it will be less expensive because you're not replacing it so frequently. Well, everything is regulated these days, as you know, and um, I'm not sure very many landowners can do much with their free flowing uh, rivers or roads without some sort of public approval. Uh, do they need public approval? And secondly, uh, are there any, is there any public support, any, any uh, funding help to do it the right way? Yeah, so if a landowner wanted to do anything to an alter a waterway in New Brunswick, um, there is a permitting process. It's called a water course alteration wetland altercation permit. Uh, it's from the province. And you don't need input from the public if you are a the landowner. So to be able to do the alteration, you need to have permission from the landowner. Uh, especially if they're minor. If they're a larger project, like if you wanted to put a dam in on your own property, obviously that is much larger um, and it can affect many people upstream and downstream of you. So that would require public input and likely an environmental impact assessment. But smaller things like putting in culverts or improving fish habitat on your property, removing trees and things like that, you would need one of these permits. They're about $10, uh, but they do require uh, review from the province to ensure that it's not going to cause any damage to the environment. Any uh, public uh, funding uh, to do something that is more environmentally sound but more expensive? Right, there's likely um, some sources out there. Uh, currently, our funding for this project comes from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, so they fund our work, um, but yeah, I'm sure there are things out there for public to support, uh, just none come to mind. Now you've mentioned, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So, uh, you know, tip of the hat to them for helping to fund this, but I think you have some other either partners or funders or supporters in universities and organizations elsewhere. Would you, would you like to acknowledge them? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with, um, you know, the other uh, communities from the past Maquati, so the Sabaic Environmental Department and Indian Township, we work with them and uh, we collaborate some of our work. Um, we do are, are starting to work with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure um, on some of these. Um, we also work with the Atlantic Salmon Federation in some capacity, looking at some of the waterways in regards to salmon habitat. 
Uh, we work, we've just started working with the Quad uh, New Brunswick group. So it's an ATV group on uh, improving passage and uh, erosion on their trails. So yeah, there are uh, quite a few project partners. Um, St. Croix International Waterway Commission, the Eastern Charlotte Waterways and uh, Conservation Council of New Brunswick are some of the other ones we work with as well. Well, great work. And uh, I have to confess that if uh, you and I had bumped into each other at, uh, I forget the name of the uh, brew pub, but the old train station in St. Stephen or on the balcony of the Algonquin Hotel, um, I n wouldn't be sure what uh, kind of a conversation I should strike up because I don't talk to very many biologists. So no doubt I have missed asking you an important question or uh, getting you to talk about an important uh, aspect of, of your research. Uh, what did I miss? <laughs> well, we're, we're actually doing a whole lot. Uh, I mean, one water quality is a very small portion of what we do. Um, our overarching goal is looking at returning uh, sea run fish to the territory. That's our overarching goal. And, uh, you know, that has a lot of um, information gathering, a lot of restoration, a lot of different pieces brought in to, to do that. Um, so we look at water quality as a physio physiochemical barrier. Uh, we look at culverts and bridges and dams as a passage barrier. We look at the presence and abundance of fish in all of the rivers and throughout the watersheds to see what is there to restore and how that's changing as we're doing restoration. Um, we do restoration itself to improve and restore them and a little bit of outreach as well. So there's a lot of components moving and working together all at the same time. So this is so the fish can get back to their natural spawning areas and make more fish and bigger fish and, and, and enjoy their natural habitat. Yep, absolutely. Interesting. Well, uh, fantastic. I hope we can check in uh, occasionally. I don't know how quickly the uh, data uh, comes in for you, but happy to check in uh, maybe at the end of the summer. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you very much. Thanks.